Hello and welcome to episode 61 of the world's first Paul Weller fan podcast. I'm Dan Jennings and 10 years ago I gave up my live stream and career as a radio presenter with one big regret. Never getting to interview my hero, the legendary British musician Paul Weller. This podcast exists purely to solve that issue. Welcome to Desperately Seeking Paul. In this episode, I'm joined by Neil Tinnings. Grab your jam album, The Gift, and you'll see him mentioned in the sleeve notes as the photographer known as Twink. Age 21, he was commissioned by the band to be their official photographer, capturing them on stage, but also their life out of the public eye. We'll chat about his love of the band and working with them towards the end, his book, The Jam Unseen, and how as a sufferer of bipolar disorder, he became an ambassador for mental health awareness. So let's get into it. Twink, it's so good to have you on. Great. Yeah. Should I call you Neil or should I call you Twink? What do you prefer? Everybody calls me Twink. It's only the wife and the children who sort of call me uh, either Dad or Neil. And where did Twink come from? When I was doing the jam, I used to work in a graphic design studio with a photographic studio as well. And uh, their um, trainees were called Winkles. I don't know why, but they were called Winkles anyway. So this got into uh, Rick Buckler has a twin brother called Pete, who I used to be really pals with. And he got it wrong. And then all of a sudden, from Winkle, it went to Twinkle. <laughs> and then on the, the gift album cover, the credit was just photographed by Twink. I was really devastated because I didn't think anybody would know who it was because it was just a, an in joke. And um, what I put, well, I assume it was Paul, well, I put down just photographs by Twink. But there is a side note. I believe there's a drummer called Twink out of the Pink Fairies. I know Buckler was into them. I don't know whether Weller was or not. I'm not sure about that. To kick this off, we should hear about when it was that you first discovered the music of Paul Weller, Bruce Foxton, Rick Buckler, because I know that it, I know for a fact it's the jam, obviously. But when, when was that? Well, when I was working in that graphic design studio, I wasn't aware of the band up until about all mod cons. And then I discovered what they'd been doing previously as well. And it was on the radio and that one of the graphic designers, he said, you've got to listen, you've got to listen to this. It's really, really good. So I listened to it and I thought, oh yeah, great. And then brother of Rick, I was pals with, he had a band called Static and it didn't do anything. But we used to go to this pub and Woking. Rick Bucker's brother turned up and I was there and what have you. And Rick had turned up with these singles um, and it was When You're Young, the single. Well, he came around the pub with a couple of singles and he gave me one. And it was, I think it was before the August because I don't think it was out at that time. So somewhere in my room here is a, a single with When You're Young. And I think it was a picture sleeve as far as I remember. But yeah, that, so I didn't really do anything with the jam up until 81. I got to know Rick through his brother and then got to know the band through Rick. So as soon as I found out I processed film, I used to process all the films for Bruce and Paul and Rick. So that, so, well, so this is their personal photos that they found out that you could process and, and have... The, for the kids listening, back in the day, we used to have take photos on film that had to be developed. So you couldn't look on the back of a camera and see what you'd taken. You had to take it to somebody else. You'd get your photos back a few weeks later. So can we get this right? The, the whole band are sending, are giving you their photos, like their holiday snaps, their pictures of their families, their, their mates and whatever for you to develop. Is that right? That's right, yeah. Yeah, I used to have to deliver them in brown paper bags. That's amazing. I love that. I got pally with them and, and, and even the uh, the minders, used to, I used to get the photos off everybody really, like films to develop, like the minders, like Joe Wyomi and I can't remember the other guy. Kenny Wheeler uh, and that. Uh, not Kenny. Chris something. Right. And uh, so basically across the whole of the, the crew and the band, you know, they would say, it was all oh, take a picture of this and print this one up for us and what have you. So I used to do all that sort of business. And at this point, were you, did you mention graphic design? Were you a photographer? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, and this, and this all started with a Zenith E camera that you got for Christmas. Was that right? That's right. Yeah. We used to photograph motorcycles and trials and scrambles and four wheel drive things and then in 77 i got really interested in the punk thing and had this entity and because i had the ability to to process my own film and print it up i started taking pictures of the local bands and that type of thing in the older shots barn and woking sort of area and my local gig was the guildford civic hall 
And I did an awful lot of bands there. And I used to get the pictures published in the local rags and what have you. So I, I did everybody from like Dr. Feelgood from the UFO. And Dr. Feelgood were the best by a long way, in my opinion. Uh, so Boom Tech Rats, not Sham 69, um, Jimmy Percy, Paul Cook and Steve Jones were going to start a super punk group and they tried it out at Guildford Civic Hall and it ended up in a riot. So, <laughs> so, then, it, so then it never happened. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> and what was it about the camera that excited you? What was it about being able to, to shoot bands in, in that time? Because obviously music-wise, that's a really exciting period, 77 and mm. onwards, and the explosion of punk and all, all those bands and, and the kind of energy and that excitement from, from that period. I think because I was a reasonable photographer, I used to get access and cameras used to be able to give you access in those days. In those days, the securities were still there, but I could normally talk my way into any gig uh, and not have to pay and take photographs. And so I did the, I, I, even though I haven't got the next, I can't find them. I did the police's first tour when they started to get big. Uh, I remember that one. There's just a plethora of bands at the time, you know, Ed, like Eddie and the Hot Rods. You know, there was those sort of bands going about. And then obviously the jam, but that was late, a lot later on. We should, I mean, you were really young at this point as well, weren't you? So what were you, what were you like, 17, yeah, was, 18 or uh, something? I was 16 and 17. Seven, right. <laughs> so and then I was twenty-one when I finished all my photographic rock career. Well, we'll get into that. Let's talk about the jam. So you mentioned about being mates with Rick and and then becoming mates with the band and having that connection. But when was it that you were asked to get involved? And it was a couple of years you worked with them, and you documenting their life on the road. Essentially, was that right? Yeah, um, basically how it worked was I was invited by Rick who took me up to the Michael Sobel Centre with Leslie's wife, girlfriend at the time. I took the Sobel shot, the one in the corridor. It was very, very weird, Dan, because I did these photos that are actually in the book. And I was sitting in Air Studios at the back. And, you know, they were doing bits of recording, what have you. And then the record people came in. And the record people came in and said, have you seen the photos? And... The band said, oh, yeah, 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 we've we'll seen them really good and all this stuff. So they're amazing, yeah, yeah. So that was Michael Sobel sent in the December. By the January, Paul Weller came up to me and said, hey, you twink, do you fancy doing the album cover? I said, yeah, yeah sure, I'd love to. So then I got the album gig. And then they said, well, we'll go on tour. Do you fancy you're doing some, like, photographs for the tour? Transcope Express 1982 tour. The first date was in Portsmouth, I remember. So I did all those sort of venues and what have you. And, but the first time I was taking live pictures, you know, like, as you would expect to be a rock photographer, you take pictures of the live performance. And um, I got a message back after the gig said, no, 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 no. We don't want you to do what other people can do. We're giving you access to what we want, which is, you know, the, the backstage stuff. And because I was sort of pally with them, it, I even used to point a camera at Paul Weller and he'd always pull this stupid grin. <laughs> and he, he was really, really quite accommodating. He, he just loved the idea of having a photographer on the road. So I, then I got into doing the sort of the documentary sort of style of photography, like fly on the wall, you know, in the dressing room just before you're going on, you know, or just in the side of the wings just to go on and then after all the gig and what have you. No, it's great. I mean, if you imagine being age 21, traveling around in a fancy big tour bus um, with a stereo and a television in the in a you know it's just unreal and nice hotels at the age of 21 and then it was you know and were you, you were traveling the world or was it the uk tour uk and i did have some dates in holland brilliant the lovely thing about it as well for me is that I mean, as you mentioned, it's capturing those moments which we wouldn't get to see otherwise because, you know, we, we yeah. see, we've seen quite a few shots from the live on stage. And I do love those kind of shots, you know. And I'm always amazed that photographers have managed to get that with the jam because everything was so fast. So they're moving at pace, everything. So how people have managed to get these great shots of, you know, Bruce up in the air, you know, the little flicks, all that kind of stuff's wicked. But for fans, I think seeing them backstage, seeing those tour bus pictures, seeing them as as mates. And I think that's really important because, you know, that, that breakup, and we'll talk about that in a second, that, and, you know, that comes fairly soon afterwards, right? But they're all having fun together, aren't they? They're all getting on with each other. To a fashion, I think most bands, most successful bands, tend to be on the verge of splitting up at any particular time. And that's what makes 
that's what I thought made the energy of, of the jam was so relevant because there was only three members. Yeah, there were mates, but they were in a, you know, they were in a, a successful band and that keeps you together for a quite a long time until someone says, I've had enough. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a picture of Paul Weller and his girlfriend who we, I mean, this is real tongue-in-cheek sort of stuff. You may find in the Jam on the Scene book, and there's a picture of Paul Weller and his girlfriend looking out of the window on the tour bus because they'd had an argument. And of course, <laughs> uh, me being me, uh, I, I went and took a picture of it. Uh, so we're in the tour bus, and the rest of the guys, you can see the, the little eyes, like, looking, you know, has he got the bollocks to go to the front of the bus and take a picture? That's how I felt about it. Yeah. So I did. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you love that. <laughs> now, I have to, I actually grab something. Say there two seconds. Hold on. I know this okay. is a podcast. And this is important. So this is the gift. This is the reissue, yeah. actually. So this is the cover that everybody will know. Um, you know, Rick on the left hand side in red, Bruce in the middle in orange, Weller on the right hand side in green, all looking like they're kind of mid run. How mm -hmm. did that come about? How did that, how, where did you get the inspiration? Where did the ideas come from? How much of it was Paul directing versus your vision? Mm -hmm. Tell us all about that album cover. Okay. The album covers initially start with the uh, going back to the Sobel Centre photographs and them liking them. The picture on the back of the album cover is a picture of them at Michael Sobel Centre. I hated that one, but Paul really loved it. So it was his album sort of thing. So fair enough. That's what he wants. That's what he'll get. The front cover, I don't like, if I'm totally honest. Initially, Paul said to me, look, we want pictures of we're running on the spot. There was a song running on the spot, wasn't there? Side two, track one, running on the spot, yeah. Right. That was the idea of running on the spot and taking photographs. My thought was they were going to trim the figure, but they didn't, and left the scaffolding in behind, which now that picture was taken at the, the top of Air Studios at Oxford Circus. I, I got each member to run on the spot for 36 frames on motorwind, and you got a do, 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 do and they're, like, they're running and what have you. Bruce didn't like the colour of his pants that he was wearing that day. So Bruce had to have a reshoot with different coloured trousers. So we did that and uh, I did some nice portrait sort of stuff. And around about the time of Town Called Malice video, I did the video shoot for it as well. So that it was a very intense period between, say, the, the January of the, the photographs right the way through to the release of the album in, I think it was March 82. And I can't tell you that I was walking down Aldershot High Street and they had a Woolworths. People today won't know who Woolworths are, but they used to be a huge outlet for music and what have you. And they had all the jam merchandise in the window. And I can't tell you how proud I was walking down the street having a look at that. Uh, it was a, a, a really nice time. I bet. Yeah, see, seeing your work out in the world would be lovely. I didn't know about the town called Malice. I, I did the video stills. Um, uh, one of the guys who was a front of house sound guy called Mike Brady, I know he wanted to get into video and I believe he had a lot to do with making the video and putting the, the set up which was actually still in their studio. So they were getting charged quite a lot of money for videoing in a, a recording studio. But yeah, I mean, there was, they did two tracks. Uh, they did the A and B, well, it was the A and B side at the time, but at the end it come out as a double A side. It's a random video in a way, because there's the guy on piano with the white gloves. Steve Nichol. Right. And then there's this weird, like, coat hat stand <laughs> that's there. I don't know why. But it's, uh, and the lighting is, like, really intense. It, they're kind of, they're almost like um, angelic in a way, kind of lit up. Yeah. And the guy on tambourine, it feels very, it feels very different to the jam that we had known up until that point, I think. Even the logo is different, isn't it? Yeah. Well, from I used to get the job to go to the McDonald's for lunch. You have to carry all the McDonald's. Oh, the glamour of it, yeah. Paul Weller would only eat chips from the McDonald's. <laughs> he wouldn't go for the Happy Meal. <laughs> oh, the veggie phase. Okay. It's not soon after, obviously, the split comes. Can you remember when it was that you heard that the jam was going to be no more? I was talking to, to Rick about this, and it, and it, I just, I still find it incredible that, you know, they agreed to split and then still went out on this big tour, still released the final singles. It wasn't that Paul decided they then, and then they called it a day from there onwards. They had these commitments, mm -hmm. so they had to make it yeah, work yeah. For, for like another six months onwards, wasn't it? So how did, can you remember when you first heard? Just trying to remember the month. It might have been about June time. I'd come back down from Newcastle, down to the south. I think it was Cherry Red 
studios. I might be wrong on that. They were having a job recording. I think it might be Alfie, Pity Poor Alfie or something mm-hmm. like that. Was, yeah. And I think that had about three re-records. So they went to this particular studio, and I went along, and Rick said, you know, you can't tell anybody, but Bart's going to split. I went, what? You're joking. Because I'd just get into a point <laughs> of this sort of like working for the biggest band in the, in the land, having exclusive access, and he wanted to pull the plug. So I think there was lots of options put to him, and he didn't pick any option like, you know, have a year off, do this, do that, reconsider in a couple of years' time or something, but just to keep it there, you know. But he was having none of it. He just said no, that so I'm I'm that's it. I'm going off to do other things. So then it was a it, originally the announcement was going to be made on the tube. Now I think that was November the fifth, eighty two, but it, it leaked out. And of course everybody was under suspicion of who leaks the fact that the band was split. I said, well, it wasn't me. He said, Well, I don't know, you've got no reason to do it. Somebody leaked it to the press. As I say, I don't know who, but somebody did. And I came back to the north to live back up in the north because I didn't really like living in London, particularly with the band splitting up because there was no reason to be there. I went down, Rick said, because I was unemployed at the time after that, he says, so come down for the the five Wembley gig uh, thing. And I got the coach down. It was, I don't know, a very, very bittersweet experience because the band were playing so well, but... You know, this this thing was hanging over them. Uh, so I did, like, the Wembley shows, and I did the last gig. Well, sorry, the second last gig was uh, Guildford, and then the final gig, December 82, was at Brighton. And there was a guy called Dave Little, who was Paul Weller's guitar roadie. Because it was the end of the tour, the rest of the crew decided that he should be strung up from his feet on one of the tr- lightning trusses. Upside down on the truss, and I took the photograph. <laughs> now, that photograph Brilliant. has never been seen. And the only reason it's never been seen is because in the January, I was doing a madness gig, and I got all my photograph gear nicked. And, of course, what was in the my photograph bag? All the films of the, the last show and a Dave Little photo and what have you. So not many people remember that, but that did actually happen. Wow, and those and those have never seen the light of day. They've never come up since. Even they've never no. returned to you or anything. Nope. Oh man, heartbreaking, right? Yeah, yeah. So then, once I didn't have any photographic gear, I sort of fell out of love with photography for many a year. Actually, it was a couple of decades before you picked up the camera again, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. And was that a yeah. mixture of that? I mean, the the kit being mixed was that was a mixture of feeling of the of that loss from the jam splitting as well? Yeah, I think there was a lot of emotional distress by the breakup i mean i I, ha- I wasn't there but i had heard that when it leaked out that the band were going to split apparently there was lots and lots of people who went to ann weller's house which was paul weller's mother's house trying to persuade ann weller to persuade paul to reconsider but i guess in re- hindsight we're only interested in the jam because they did split and because they cemented themselves in history. You know, if it had been like the Stranglers who went on and on and on, I don't think they had, even though the Stranglers were my preferred band, I don't think they have the level of loyalty and keeping the faith with the jam, even though it's no longer there. Yeah, I heard Noel Gallagher talking about this as Oasis recently, because obviously he's got his greatest hits has been out in recent months. And he was saying about, you know, the, towards the tail end of Oasis, you know, people liked the live shows and were going to the live gigs, but they wanted to hear the classics. They wanted to hear the hits. The last few mm-hmm. albums, people were, you know, were really pretty lukewarm about. But actually right. since then, since, you know, since he left Oasis, and you can see now that all anybody talks about is this legendary band Oasis. And you can see probably in 20 years time, it'll be similar to the jam, right? Right? That moment in time, you're absolutely right. You think five years, the jam, 77, 82, done. That's not an awful lot of songs, but man, that stacks up, doesn't it? It does when you look at the clarity and the work, song and writing of those songs. To come out of Paul at that point in his life was amazing, really. When you look back, you think, where did you get that from? I know he's always influenced by other bands, and I think he, ha- he still has a huge record collection. Because uh, the did one song, it was a bit like Papa's Got a New Pig Bag. I don't know if you remember that single. And it was very similar to something that they were working on. So when I was asked my opinion, which is never very often, 
I used to say, oh, well, that sounds like such and such, or that sounds like this or that. Yeah. Well, and, and even if you talk about the gifts of the album where your, you know, your artworks on that or your photos on that covers, you know, Town Called Malice, we're talking Happy Together, Ghosts, Precious. Some of these songs are right up there as the very best. And you, and you say they, I mean, they went out on a high. They were sounding better than ever, weren't they? Yeah, they were. When they were recording Town Called Malice, I remember, I think it was Pete Wilson, who was the producer, saying, you can smell the gold on this one. <laughs> Smell the gold, boys. <laughs> Brilliant. I love that. Now, we should talk about your uh, the book and the exhibition that you had. So um, we mentioned that the camera kind of goes away for, for 20 years. But how did the exhibition come about of these f- uh, photographs? Was it an invitation from somebody? Was it you just opening a box and, and rediscovering stuff? How did that happen? Well, it was John Abner who was really keen. He knew that I had quite a lot of photographs, probably through Dennis Monday, because I still keep in touch with uh, Dennis and, and Rick and what have you. And I thought, well, I've got these photographs. I better do something with them. So I was touting around for a book deal. And John Adnett come on the scene. He says, oh, you've got to make a decision on these. These are, you know, I know what you've got, it's special. And he approached one of his suppliers called Cyan, who were based. And the only reason I signed one is because they were in Waldorf Street. So, uh, a <laughs> bomb. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I signed up with them and uh, they only did a 2000 run and apparently you can't get them now no there's uh, no way I mean I've not got a copy of the book because it's mm-hmm. impossible to get out of mate initially there was a, a launch in a pub in Soho for the life of me can't think why <laughs> um, but I do have there's a, lot, there's a picture with uh, lots of them with the jam on scene you know holding the jam up scene but the last time I looked on Amazon, apparently somebody's got one for sale, but I think he wants a grand for it. That doesn't go to you, though, does it, annoyingly? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> to be honest, I, I, I've only got the kids' supply books left for myself. So. But what I do have is, you know, uh, the book, you, you could get a limited edition, a blue and black candy stripe book cover, and it's individually numbered, and it comes with a picture I took from the live shots that I did of Portsmouth. And you can see it within them. They're absolutely going for this. It's just about, as a music photography, you've got to understand about music and where the accents are. And it's just on an accent where the, the Rick will hit his snare drum and a crash cymbal and Bruce will be, his leg will be in the air and Paul will be, you know, looking really aggressive and what have you. And it's got a lot of energy in that picture. But incidentally, I didn't get the photograph when Paul ran out from the Michael Sobel sent a side stage and fell over on his ass. <laughs> he had a habit of that. I think, did he fall? He fell over in the style council, broke his arm. I heard the other week. Is he? <laughs> <laughs> calm down, Paul, calm down. Well, I always used to take the piss out of me because he'd say, hey, Twink, see if you can go and sell these outside and it'll be his dirty underpants from the, the gig. <laughs> Uh, now, there's a couple of other things I want to touch on, um, one of which, if you don't mind me talking about, is, is your film Last Chance Saloon, which is just brilliant. I mean, I only, I only dug into it because of research for this. Um, so this was in 2011, so 10 years ago, you approached the Wellcome Trust, with, and the idea was you wanted to understand mental health illnesses, having gone through that stuff yourself. And you, yeah. you were going to be interviewing these, these neuroscience experts in their favourite locations yeah. whilst taking photographs of them, which was just a lovely mm-hmm. idea, but it all kind of links in with your band as well. So tell me about your band and tell me about the film. In 1995, I had a big mental health breakdown and I've never worked since so it took me oh, a good few years to get get sort of relatively stable because I, I had a habit of, sort of like trying to top myself became patron of MDF the bipolar organization because I'm bipolar and I was asked to take over as a patron because Spike Milligan had died mm. and Spike Milligan was bipolar as well so I took that on and I said well look I'll do your media for you I did EastEnders for two years, advising on storylines and uh, scripts. I was big in mental health, should I say. You know, I was you know, somebody that could phone up somebody and say, right, OK, can we do this? Can we do that? Uh, so I had lots of media contacts. I did a film for the BBC called Surviving Suicide, which was a sports relief documentary. And it won an award at BAFTA, actually. And I've got a photograph of me up on stage with the 
the technical crew getting the award. So I used to do quite a lot of that sort of stuff. And then after that, I phoned up Barry Gibb, not the Barry Gibb, but a different Barry Gibb, and uh, a welcome trust. And I said, look, we should do something more. You know, thought about it and said, yeah, it'd be really good to have sort of like a fly in the wall type documentary of, you know, somebody in mental health distress. So you will see me on the morning after a, a really heavy duty night of suicidal isolation is what it's called. So then Professor Nick Craddock, because I used to be really good buddies with him and, and he was the treasurer of uh, the Royal College of Psychiatrists and all this sort of business. And Welcome Trust said, yeah, we'd love to. Do you want five grand? We'll, we'll give you five grand to do the gig. Oh, great. Well, then it's sort of like I got some money to put the band together, and we did. And we filmed each other for nine months. The gig was on 28th of March, 2012. Then they went into post-production. It got released, I think, in 2014. And it's, to be honest with you, it's done nothing. <laughs> yes, yes. I just don't get it. But I guess it's boring to people. It's interesting because I, know, I find the subject and topic of mental health really fascinating because I've had a couple of guests on who is, it was a topic I should have dug into more, mm-hmm. with them, right? And I think there's still an element where we tipped her around it a little bit. And I was going to ask you, when you took over from Spike Gill- Milligan, that was that was almost 20 years ago, wasn't it? So it was 2002. Yeah. I think back then particularly, there was a, probably a, you know, a real stigma around mental health issues. It seems like something we're talking more about now. And you see like the ITV campaign with, you know, with Ant and Deck talking about mental health and the importance of having conversations and stuff. But do you still feel there is a stigma around it or do you feel that it's we're, we're coming through and things are changing? No, right up until probably the last general election, I would say, yeah, it, it was very, very stigmatised. It is stigmatised now for people who don't have the issue. But when you start saying, well, hang on a minute, I've got these issues, and then you start to find out that other people have these issues. And when you learn the, the statistic of 25% of the population will suffer some form of mental ill health in their lifetime, it means that's an awful lot of people. That's, what, 12 and a half million or so mm. in the UK? That's what I used to do, destigmatization of mental health through EastEnders, through the films. But yeah, I think mental health now, it's it's really quite fashionable to be bipolar or fashionable to have this or fashionable to have that. But certainly, as far back as uh, my memory goes, I would say it started to turn around about 2014. Nowadays, you get mental health stories on the front of the BBC website. So, yes, it is getting better, but there's an awful long way to go. And the numbers aren't changing, are they? I think, you know, even just no. you talk about like male suicide rates, particularly, um, yes. is, is frightening, isn't it? It's, um, mm-hmm. so, so, you know, so I think the film's a really incredible piece of work. There's, there's one line in there that I wanted to touch on, which was um, you talk about music. And every time you talk about music, your eyes light up, whether it's with your bandmates creating the songs for the for the album. It's the Tin Stones, isn't it, your, your band? That's there's, right, yeah. There's this gig at the end, which, which all kind of notes in as well, but the album Last Chance Saloon. But there's this line where you talk about music soothing your soul. And yeah. then you follow it up with you have to find your soul in the first place, which got me. Uh-huh. But clearly music is a big deal to you. And, and it is something that um, a couple of my guests have talked about. And actually, when I read the latest Mojo issue with Paul, he was talking about mental health and and how music, you know, really has helped him in that world and in that space as well. Yeah, definitely. I, you've got to talk about mental health issues because it's it's fundamental to life. You know, if you you're having these issues because you can think. If you couldn't think, you wouldn't have these issues. So unfortunately, it goes with the territory, and, and there certainly seems to be more creative people who suffer than. The rest, you know, if you look, any creative industry normally is run on people with slight to severe mental health problems. Because, you know, with mental health, you you know, you try to think or you think outside the box. Sometimes people don't like thinking out of the box because they're, they're set on this, this is what I do. It's all in compartmentalized in your head. I think you've just got to start talking about it. That's all I've ever done is talk about it and say, well, look, 
I've had these issues. I think it's interesting from a creative point of view, like you say, though, because I think sometimes, yeah, and, and Paul, you know, you, you dig into some of the lyrics, and I'm thinking around mm-hmm. heliocentric, there's a, there's a track on there that springs to mind immediately, Frightened. Somebody can only write that if they've been in some kind of, you know, depths of despair at some point. And, and yeah. you see that in so many uh, music songwriters, Chris Difford and I talked about this a little, that you have to have the extremes. That's part of that creative process. Absolutely. Right? Yeah it's, yeah, it's strange, isn't it? I mean, look at Ray Davis. He's got severe bipolar, I think. He certainly had mental health problems. But, you know, the, f- the films were designed to be really at a certain type of person. And it was like aimed at uh, trainee psychiatrists and mental health professionals. Because I don't think, I can't recall anybody else who's sort of like done what I've done through the films. And that is to be totally honest and show you what it's like. Well, I've got the white face and because all the blood's drained out and you're in shock. I could only do a little bit. Yeah, and I saw, I don't know if you've seen the recent Matt Dayton um, documentary, and Matt was on the show because he, he worked with Paul around Heavy Soul period. And there was part of that where he was talking about, you know, he disappeared off the face of the earth because of you know, mental health reasons um, for, for a good kind of 15 years. Um, and there was a bit in the documentary where he was flying out to Spain to work with Dr. Robert and the day the day of or the morning before the flight, again, had, had what he called another episode, I think is how he phrased mm-hmm. it. It throws you a real curve. You know, when you find out, you look at other people and you think, nah, they, they're not bipolar or, or whatever. And then you find out they're very good at hiding it. And the importance of conversation. So I think it's important for us to chat about it. I think you opening up in the film, I'm glad that we could have a chat about it as well, Twink, because I think it's, um, you know, it's important to me to kind of touch on that sometimes on these on these things. And like I say, I think yeah. I've scurried around it with some other guests, but I really wanted to kind of dig into it because of your work. Um, I'm going to get back to the jam. So when you look back on that portfolio, when you read through the jam unseen, your book that you talked about and these kind of never before seen images of the band um, how do you feel when you look at those and, and you look at that time period i have to be honest and say it seems to be like a different life it's something i've experienced but it's not an everyday occurrence you know so therefore i feel a sense of achievement through the book there's no words in the book apart from the last page and it just says and paul left the band and there's a picture of rick and bruce sitting on Saddleworth Moor, looking in opposite direction. And it just says, and Paul left the band. And that was the end of the book, because they're all pictures. There's very little writing in it. I think it also shows how we've moved on. If you look at the televisions in the hotels or in the tour bus and things like that, the televisions look like that in those days. They don't look like that nowadays. <laughs> they were massive, weren't they? So it, it gives you a sense of history. And it's interesting that if you look at pop stars of of the 1980s and you look at the the fans, the pop stars or the the Paul Wellers of this world, the style icons, always looking as if it's right, it's the right image for them at that particular time. And when you look back, you think to yourself, wow, weren't their audience really straight compared to what the fashions were at the time? And the average fan would be a Parker and... Uh, a sort of like a jam ticket thrust ready to go and see the band. You know, you look at the Sobel picture, you don't see what I could hear. I could hear 5,000 people go, we want the jam, <laughs> we want the jam. And they're just sitting having a fag. What number are we going to do next, boys? Because they're in between encores, you see. Brilliant. Um, yeah. Oh, wow. And you're backstage at that point, are you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Wow, that's so cool. Man, what a, yeah, got like you say, but it feels like another world ago, right? Yeah, it does. I've had a <clears throat> reasonable career in photography, but I've had a better career in mental health as far as publicity is concerned. But just going back to the band, the band thing is, um, again, something that is in the documentaries, which is it's sort of therapy for me. So, you know, that's why I do it. I've got a lovely little studio here. I, you know, I play the banjo and got a little band going and, just nice. Hey, Twink, this has been so lovely. I've loved every second of this, man. Thank you so much for joining me and opening up and talking about all this stuff. Um, I have two final questions for you. The first question is, you're allowed one Paul Weller song for the rest of your life. It can be The Jam, The Style Council, or Solo. Which one are you going to go with? Scrape away. Oh, I didn't know. That, that's a curveball. I didn't know you were going to go with that one. Why, why that one? That's a great, great song. Um, it's my favourite jam song, and um, none of the tribute. Acts can play it because of the timing. So, I, I mean, I've checked that out with Rick. I said to Rick, I said, look, you know, because it's the closest thing to what I'm into, which is sort of like more 
reggae or a sort of scar. There's this, this little scar influence in there, and it's like a, this constant drum. But yeah, apparently a lot of the tribute bands can't play it because of the, the time signature. So. <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> I love that. Uh, they'll all be like, "What? I'm going <laughs> to. We're going to prove him wrong." <laughs> yeah, yeah. Go on. Then. <laughs> F- final question for you. So the purpose of this podcast is not only to talk to lovely people like yourself, but it's to get the interview with Paul Weller that I never managed in my radio career. What should I talk to him about? If it ever happens, is there anything you think I should talk to Paul about? Anything you think I should ask him? Uh, good question. Good question. Um, I can't think of anything cracking. That I mean, the only thing I would say is, could you talk more in depth of why you wanted to split the band? I think I know the answer would be, if the truthful answer would be probably something to do with pressure. Because when you you know you're at that height and you're, you're responsible for all, all your own creative work is responsible for a crew of thirty people, and you've got to feed this crew of people with money. You know, it, it gets into a being a business. It says it's writing, it's recording, it's touring, it's writing, it's recording, and it gets on this roller coaster thing. So that's why I think he probably wanted out of that. The pressure would be yeah, absolutely incredible. Oh, I don't know what I've got. I've got a good question for you. In the book, the guy who was the manager of Pink Floyd, he claims that. You blew out America because you wouldn't turn up for the interviews. Is this Brian Morrison? Yes, the one. Yeah, he's got a book that um, I've not read yet, but it's the memoir of the man behind Pink Floyd, T-Rex, George Michael, and The Jam, it says. Yes, he was their music publisher, and it was called Anson. He had to do a press conference. He wouldn't do the press conference. So he fucked everybody off by not doing it. And that's why I think Brian Morrison says that's why they blew America. Oh, interesting. Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, his, tra- his tale was kind of really, he owned like a polo club and had like a really tragic polo accident, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and left behind this unpublished memoir, which is the book you're talking about, right? Okay. Yeah, no, yeah. I, have, I, have, I have dug into that. Um, that's interesting. What a great question. Wow. <laughs> nice one. Yes. Now the story is almost like the, the, the America wasn't of interest to the jam. They didn't really give a shit. They, they came back home for Top of the Pops when Going Underground went to number one and stuff it's, yeah. it's weird that that was never i don't know why that was never a thing that actually they wanted to crack john weller wanted to do madison square gardens so that was his his ambition but I, I i i totally support what you just said they weren't interested in america so that's a great one hey twig thank you so much for your time i've enjoyed every second of this i will put links to the film in the show notes as well um if we manage to find a link to the book that's under a thousand pounds i'll share that as well <laughs> <laughs> all the very best for the future my friend thanks so much okay and do you want me to play out with uh, uh, can't sing it but I can play it on banjo butterfly collector oh why not go on yeah that'd be lovely
<laughs> hey man, that is so good. Thanks so much. You're a star. No problem at all. We enjoyed the chat. My thanks once again to Twink. Amazing to have him on the podcast and to hear his fabulous take on Butterfly Collector as well. You can find links to the things we talked about in our show notes. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please follow and leave a review. It helps us to find new listeners to the show and do share on your social media channels. You can also buy me a coffee and find more information about my guests in the show notes for this podcast. Get in touch on Twitter at WellerFanPod or on Instagram and Facebook. It's Paul Weller Fan Podcast. I'll see you next time.